Just kiss me once and kiss me twice and kiss me once again. It's been a long, long time. Haven't felt like this, my dear, since can't remember when. It's been a long, long time. You'll never know how. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Living History. Thank you for your ongoing support of the podcast, for tuning in and responding in such a positive way. It's really great to get that feedback. So keep sending your emails in, keep reviewing us and follow what we're doing. We've got lots of great stuff coming up in the coming weeks and months. I'm going to visit a ship next week, which I'll be talking about in a few weeks' time. That'll be up on the podcast. Uh, The most exciting thing is I've got my big trip to France and the UK coming up for Anzac Day. And while I'm over there, I'm going to do lots of great things. I'm going to walk battlefields. I'm going to visit historic sites. I'm going to speak to amazing historians. And it's going to be absolutely fantastic, some of the episodes we're going to produce there. So look out for those a little bit later in the year. Also, really excited to announce that I'm not just going to be doing audio from now on as well. I'm going to start doing video. I'm going to start filming these podcasts and these visits to, to historic sites And you're going to see that as well. I'm going to start making mini documentaries, which I'll put up on YouTube. I'll put on the Facebook page. I'll link to them on Twitter. You'll be able to find those all over the web. And I'm really excited about that. So look out for those as well. I'll announce those as soon as they're available. Um, Bit of a shout out to, I got a visit this week from Adam Bloom, who is someone who's been on our tours before. He came with us to Gallipoli in 2015. He's coming again with his whole family to Villas Bretno for Anzac Day this year. It was great to see Adam uh, and to hear about his enthusiasm for the podcast and everything else that we're doing. So if you are someone who's been with us on a tour, if you're enjoying the podcast, send us a note. Feel free to shoot us a message saying hello. It's always good to hear from people who are out there about their response to these great history stories. I love bringing them to you guys, so let me know if you love hearing about them. And if you've got suggestions for future podcasts, shoot those through as well. Speaking of podcasts, we've got a really special one today. We are speaking to Christina Toomey, who is a professor of history at Monash University in Melbourne. And she's got a new book coming out, which is called The Battle Within. It's available now, and it's about POWs in Australia immediately after the Second World War. And this is a topic we just don't discuss enough. We know about the prisoners of war. We know what they went through in Changi. We know what they went through on the Thai Burma Railway. We know what they went through in camps in Germany. Uh, really horrific stories, some of the worst stories of the Second World War. But the bit of the story we don't know is what happened to them when they came home. What was their life like coming back to Australia? How did they fit back into society? How did this affect their families? How did this affect their jobs? What was their health like in the years after the Second World War? And Christina's book, The Battle Within, is absolutely fascinating because it tells all those stories. And she's found some fantastic resources, some great archival material that tells this story in the words of the prisoners. So I'm really excited about it. Let's hear from Christina. Let's hear about POWs in post-war Australia and her book, The Battle Within. I'm Matt McLaughlin. This is Living History. A date which will live in infamy. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Well, may we say God save the Queen. Because nothing will save the Governor General. There's a second plane just crashed into the World Trade Center. I think we have a terrorist attack. This was their final hour. Christina, thanks for coming on the show. It's uh, it's a really great book. I've I've been really enjoying reading it, and I'd have to say it's a book that is overdue. We haven't looked at this side of the prisoner experience before. What was it that inspired you to write this book in the first place? Thanks, Matt, for your nice words about the book. A number of things inspired me. I guess the first was an experience from my childhood. So I lived as part of the RAF community on Butterworth during the late 1970s. And one vacation my family took was up to um, Thailand and Burma and we went to Kanchanaburi where there's... um, the remains of the Thai Burma Railway and we saw, you know, the the cliched bridge across the River Kwai. So I became aware of the experience of prisoners of war in the region and we also took a trip to Singapore and visited the surrender chambers and I became aware that not just male military personnel but women and children, British women and children were also captured by the Japanese Mm. 
So I was aware of that experience right from when I was a young child before I was a teenager really and then my awareness of the experience of British women and children led me ultimately to write a book about Australian civilian internees called Australia's Forgotten Prisoners and a key to that project had been the papers of the Civilian Internees Trust Fund that the federal government had created in the 1950s and when I came to think about prisoners of war and the fact that they were now a very well-known group of Australians compared to when I'd visited the railway in the early 1980s when nobody much was talking about them. I wondered if there was something similar to the Civilian Internees Trust Fund that I could look up their experiences. And there was. There was a Prisoners of War Trust Fund and I began looking at those papers. So, so it was two things coming together, really. It was both my personal experiences, but also some of my experiences as a historian. Well, that the trust fund documents uh, sound like a really fascinating resource, and I want to get to that in a minute. But you touched on something that I think is really important that, that really comes out in the book, in the earliest pages of the book, in fact, is that we, uh, we, we forgot about these men in some ways. Our attitudes to the prisoners now, we look back on these men as having paid a huge sacrifice for Australia. Uh, but there was a period of time, wasn't there, after the war, when the, these, you know, we, we'd kind of forgotten about these men. Yes, yeah, so now I think it would be fair to say that up there with Gallipoli veterans, probably prisoners of war, particularly those of the Japanese, are, are among our most well-known veterans and probably those for whom Australian society feels almost the greatest sympathy as having suffered the most for their commitment and their service, if you like. But there was a time before the 1980s where the POW was a much more ambivalent figure, where the POW wasn't commemorated by the federal government in any way and where the army particularly was very ambivalent about them. So I guess the book is about looking at that experience from late 1945 when they first come home up until the 1980s and 1990s where they do become these very celebrated and commemorated veterans. So there's a difference and I think we need to remember that, that um, there was a time when POWs were less fated and less recognised as inverted commas, heroes that we see them as today. Well, your book does a wonderful job in in bridging that gap. Um, This treasure trove of documents that you found, which I I take it was veterans in their own words talking about their experiences with prisoners. Tell us about that. Tell us about the discovery. Tell us about what you found out about these men from these documents that, that they'd written decades ago. The POW Trust Fund was created in the 1950s and that's that's a documentary base that I really used a lot in the book. And I think before I talk about those documents, we need to understand the context that that decision to create that fund came out of. And that context was in the late 1940s and the early 1950s, there were a group of ex-POWs and their associations who were really pushing very hard for the Commonwealth Government to compensate prisoners of war. So prisoners of war, like all other returned service personnel, were entitled to repatriation benefits. Australians of a particular generation will be very familiar with the repat and the service pensions that veterans were able to apply for. So POWs were already entitled to that. But there was a group of returned prisoners who said, do you know what? During our captivity, the army was not required to feed and clothe us. They didn't provision us. So in a sense, we're entitled to a bit more compensation than other people for the suffering that we have endured. And they put this case to the federal government and the federal government twice, the Labor government said no. And in the 1949 election campaign, Robert Menzies said, let's open this up and have a look at it and we'll have an inquiry. So there's a big inquiry, government inquiry, into whether prisoners of war should get this compensation payment. That inquiry concluded that 
prisoners of war from neither theatre, from neither the Pacific nor the European theatre, should receive a compensation payment because if the government were to award that amount of money, it would discourage soldiers in future wars from fighting on. That seems like an extraordinary decision from the government to make to its you know, returning heroes from the Second World War. It's an astonishing decision, but it was really in keeping with the army's view. So the army's view was that to surrender was a matter of dishonour and that no soldier who had surrendered should be distinguished in any way from other troops who had, in their words, borne the whole load. So they were not interested in singling out the POWs for any special treatment. They certainly weren't interested in giving them any other extra special payment. And they were hugely influential in uh, advising the government and advising the commissioners on this inquiry that they were not to compensate prisoners of war. So the army had a very strong hand in the outcome of that inquiry. It's really quite extraordinary because it, it suggests that uh, that there was this 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 very negative attitude towards the prisoners at all levels. I mean, what what was the what was the attitude of people to prisoners of war at the conclusion of the war? What did the obviously the military thought of them pretty poorly, but what was the public attitude? I mean, what did what did members of the public think about these men who come back? What did the men themselves think about their experience as prisoners? I think the answer to that question is really complicated. And I don't think there's just one response to them, which, you know, when we come to read and write history, we like everything to be clear and for there to be one one way of interpreting something. And I think with the prisoner of war issue, it's, it's really complicated. So on the one hand, you have the army who is saying to surrender is a matter of dishonour, we don't want to commemorate these men, we don't want to, and small number of women, we don't want them to be distinguished from other veterans in any way. Then you have the Australian public who are deeply sympathetic to the terrible experiences that prisoners had gone through during the war. And I think we're all familiar with those really shocking images of emaciated men in loincloths lying prone on bamboo racks. And those images were published in the daily newspapers in the late 1940s. So they're images that the Australian government thinks it's okay for their people to see. And as you can imagine, that that leads to enormous sympathy for the dreadful suffering that those people had undergone. But there's also another thing happening at the same time, which is that These people, particularly the men, present a contradiction, if you like, to the Anzac legend. So the Anzac legend has been based on the idea that Australians are particularly good fighters, that they have uh, amazing physical appearance and, 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 and great fighting technique, that they're strong and that they're brave fighters. But the POW is a defeated soldier, the POW has surrendered and they are the physical opposite of those sturdy Anzacs who beckon from recruitment posters throughout the war. So immediately you have this contradiction, if you like. There's the Anzac legend of the strong fighter, the well-built man, and then you have the prisoner who's defeated, who's emaciated, who is down, as if you like. So their just their very physical ex- appearance and their wartime experiences contradict the Anzac legend and people have great difficulty coming to terms with that. And one of the groups who have the most difficulty is the prisoners themselves. So many of them in the years after the war would say that they felt some kind of shame for being taken prisoner, that they felt like they hadn't participated in the war in ways that they had wanted to. And there was a a sense that there was something a bit shameful about being taken prisoner. So you can see it's quite complicated. 
<laughs> it certainly is. Um, I, I, I have to say, I think it's wonderful that today we remember them as part of the Anzac legend, not uh, not as you say in these separate contexts where they're they're different from the images of the men on the posters, but they're they're a very important part of the Anzac legend. But on that subject of how the the army in particular thought of them when they first came back, there was a quote in the book which I, I want to read out now because it struck me as actually quite shocking. This was from General Blamey, who was the commander of the Australian military forces. And he wrote, you quote him in the book as saying, it must be held foremost in mind that surrender to the enemy on the part of the soldier in preference to death is dishonourable. And I just think that's extraordinary. That I, I mean, I've done a lot of work about Japanese prisoners, Japanese soldiers who were captured by the Australians. And that's the sort of, uh, the sort of attitude you expect from the Japanese, this idea of death before dishonour. It's absolutely remarkable that an Australian general would be making these comments, particularly, I have to say, when a lot of these men had no choice in the surrender, but it was generals and people higher up who made that decision for them. It certainly was a decision of those higher up the chain of command to surrender rather than the ordinary private, if you like. But General Blamey's view was the, a view held by the the brass in the army for quite a long time, and and they enacted that by... Uh, When the returned prisoners first came back from Europe, so those obviously in the European theatre were released earlier than those held by Japan, there was a preliminary decision taken to not have um, big fanfare accompanying their return, to whisk them off to meet their family kind of behind closed doors because the army didn't want to draw attention to the fact of of their imprisonment. So it, it... It runs deep, (laughs) that ambivalence to them in the army, for sure. It certainly does. Do you, in your experience, think there was a difference in the attitude to the prisoners who'd been captured in North Africa, to people captured in the European theatre, bomber crews, for example, who'd been shot down on bombing raids? Was there a difference in attitude after the war to those prisoners uh, compared to the prisoners of the Japanese who'd been captured en masse in Singapore, for example? There was a perception among the Australian public, certainly, that... Prisoners who'd been taken in Europe hadn't suffered as much as those who'd been taken prisoner by Japan. And this is a difficult issue to, to discuss, I think, because how do you how do you measure suffering? One person's suffering might be acute and another's might be minor, but it, it's a very individual thing sometimes. So there were groups of prisoners from Europe who felt that their own suffering had been overlooked because in comparison to those who'd been taken prisoner by Japan, it didn't look quite so bad. They didn't they didn't emerge from those camps with the same levels of emaciation and malnutrition and and injuries that that those who came out of Asia did. So and you know, and we must remember too that the death rates were much lower. So in the European case, death rates were 1% or 2%, whereas prisoners of Japan, one in three people died. That's a huge difference. It's just such a horrific, uh, horrific concept, this idea. Imprisonment is bad enough, and I think for a soldier to suddenly be out of the fight and to be imprisoned is, is very traumatic in and of itself, and there's no doubt that what the prisoners in, in Europe went through was uh, a very difficult time. But obviously that time the Japanese, uh, the prisons of the Japanese had, uh, particularly working on the Thai Burma Railway, uh, on, in prison camps all across Asia, was some of the most barbaric treatment of Australians we've ever seen. And it, it probably leads us back to these documents, doesn't it? I, you know, I diverted us away in our conversation, away from talking about this fantastic trove of documents. But, but I really... think I did that diversion. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's so much to talk about on this subject. I mean, we could, we could really go off in, in numerous directions. But tell us about those documents. Tell us why they exist and what the men were trying to do, because it really is a catalogue of suffering in a lot of ways, isn't it? It is, and and my apologies for going down the failed compensation claim path, but once that compensation claim failed, politically it was a bit of a hot potato because people were very disappointed. So one of the ways that the government got around managing its various constituencies was to say, well, we won't award you compensation, but we will create this body called the Prisoners of War Trust Fund and we'll fund it with some of the money from um, 
Japanese assets that we get through a particular clause of the peace treaty and we'll also put some of our own money into it. So they create it in 1952, partly out of the ashes of the failed compensation claim. And they say that uh, the POW Trust Fund is there for return prisoners from either theatre. So both prisoners from Europe and Asia could apply to the fund. If they had ongoing major disability that they could prove was directly referable to the conditions of captivity. So that's a lot of clauses, but that was quite deliberate because the trustees wanted to make sure that they weren't going to give money to complaints that were relatively minor or happened after the war through no um, relationship to war experiences. And the trustees could give grants of up to £250, which is about $500. So when they create this fund, they then send out a call for applications and return prisoners receive a fool's cap form that they can fill in to detail how they feel they're still suffering a major disability after the war as a result of being a prisoner. Now, as is often the way with these things, people can't confine themselves to a fool's cap form, particularly people who are in pain or people who feel unheard. So many former POWs enter quite a long correspondence with this fund describing their lives, what's happened to them since their release, how their captivity has continued to impact on them. And there's over 7,000 applications to this fund and nobody had looked at them since the day they were stored away many years ago when the fund closed in 1977. So I was very privileged to receive special access to the series and to be able to look at those papers and see exactly what former prisoners were writing about how they felt now, 10, 20 years afterwards, about their experience of captivity. So they're an incredibly rich resource. It's, it's an amazing resource. I'm just picturing this situation where the government is writing to tens of thousands of former prisoners of war and inviting them to reply, telling them how bad their life now was and providing evidence of, of what being a prisoner had done to them. It's, it's, it's absolutely extraordinary. What sort of information were those men giving in these forms they were sending back in? All sorts of things and, and, and many, many areas that I didn't really expect to read about. So people would describe their physical disabilities but they also might digress to talk about how they now, now felt about the Japanese. They might talk about their struggles with alcoholism and depression, their difficulties with work, uh, the attitude that employers had towards them, the experiences that they'd had within their families. And I think the astonishing thing about these records and their one of the reasons why they're so unusual and so important is that by and large the people who wrote into that fund were from the other ranks. So there's a few officers but most of them are from the non-officer class. And these are people who, you know, given that most of them are born 1920s or earlier, most of them are not hugely well-educated so they're not people who are very accustomed to expressing themselves in written form. They're not people who are most likely to keep letters and diaries and journals. So they're a group of people that for historians it can be very difficult to access their feelings and thoughts, you know. So to have these letters written in the hand of people who don't usually keep those kind of records is, is fantastic. And I, you know, historians describe it as striking archival gold. When I opened them and started reading them, I couldn't believe it. I was pretty happy. <laughs> I'm, I'm not surprised by that because you're so right. It's, it's such a great point that you make. These men who formed the bulk of the army, they did all the hard work. The, the, you know, wars are fought by privates and corporals. And these are the men we don't hear from very much these days because they simply didn't leave records behind. So I can see why you were so excited about that. 
And it reminds me that a few weeks ago we had Peter Hart on the program who is an oral historian at the Imperial War Museum and he was talking about the importance of the interviews that he's conducted with veterans over the years because it reveals information that otherwise would be completely lost to history because they didn't write it down, they didn't put it in diaries, they didn't put it in letters home. And this strikes me as exactly the same thing because of the nature of their very difficult circumstances because the government was effectively inviting them to say what lasting effects did being a prisoner have on your life? We have this huge trove of information um, about about their life after the war. And the fact that they've written it in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s is also really important because, as you know, there's been a big effort to collect oral histories from prisoners of war. So there was a very famous program made by Tim Bowden and Hank Nelson in the 1980s called POW Australians Under Nippon, where they went round and interviewed hundreds of POWs and made a beautiful Radio National series about it that I would recommend anyone who's interested in these issues listens to. And they were the first people to really conduct oral history interviews with the prisoners of war. But there's a difference between the way people remember their experiences and the way they write about them when they're occurring at the time. And this is why these documents are so special because they're they're hardcore primary evidence of what people were thinking in the 50s and in the 60s about what being a prisoner meant at a time when there wasn't a huge amount of government sympathy for them. So... It's, it's testimony about their experience that hasn't been refracted through the lens of memory. It's a wonderful resource. I mean, we're, you know, we're so lucky that you've come across it and put it in this book because you see that in every page of the book. Could you give us some examples? Can you tell us some stories of, of, of soldiers that you came across, of ex-prisoners you came across, and the sorts of challenges they were facing in their lives? Sure. So one thing I did in the book was instead of I really wanted to talk about how captivity had impacted particular individuals. And so I made a decision rather than to just pull out, you know, key themes like alcoholism or homelessness or whatever the theme might be, I'd reconstruct the lives of three individuals in particular. So a good example might be a man I called Kenneth. And it's important to realise that Kenneth was not his real name and I changed the, I gave the case study pseudonym so they couldn't be identified by their family. But Kenneth was a man who had not slightly murky origins, but he he was born to a woman who was only 13. He appears to have never known his father. But by the time he was in his 20s, he'd managed to fetch up in Queensland. He'd married quite well, the daughter of hoteliers, He'd had a job as an insurance salesman. His life was on track after quite a rocky beginning. Then he signs up when his first child is a toddler, uh, goes and sees action in Malaya and is captured within sort of 20 days or something. So he, he spends his war in a prisoner of war camp and he also has quite a traumatic experience during that time so he's a he's a driver for a car of a Japanese officer in Burma and he has to drive this Japanese officer to a place every day where a former policeman I think who'd worked for the British was being tortured and he used to drive this Japanese officer to the torture chamber, if you like, every day and hear the screams of this man being tortured. And he did this for five days. And on the fifth day, he was required to pick up the torture victim's wife and child and drive them to the torture chamber and have them get out of the car and go and witness the body of their husband and father. And so this is a very traumatic thing to have witnessed and and be party to. So this experience stays with him after the war and he recounts it in vivid detail to war war crimes investigators. Anyway, he comes back uh, and he has a lot of trouble settling down. While he's been away, his wife 
uh, has had the in-laws move in and the in-laws have kind of taken over the house and he's really not happy about this. And he writes a letter to the POW Trust Fund saying, you know, I, I've escaped from the Japanese but now my own home feels like a prison because I'm living with this mother-in-law who I really can't stand. And he takes to drinking and the family loses its its sources of income and they end up in a housing estate in Brisbane called Rock Lee, which is like repurposed Air Force huts that is a quite overcrowded kind of public housing facility in Brisbane that, that runs for quite a few years after the end of the Second World War. And while they're resident there, one of his children dies of diphtheria. So, And he also describes this being in Rock Lee as being kind of a bit like being in a Japanese POW camp. And, you know, his life goes on and he has conflict with his wife and he ends up being imprisoned for uh, some, some minor crimes and, and also ends up ultimately as a psychiatric patient at Wacol in Brisbane, which was a psychiatric facility for disturbed return servicemen. And all the while he's fighting with his wife. But in the end, he does stay together with her. They get a small war service home. He manages to pay that off once he ends up on a full TPI pension, so totally and permanently incapacitated. But I think one of the reasons I I wrote that story up was because I wanted to show that people who had family, wealthy families that could fold them back in, give them a period where they could maybe um, recuperate, get, get themselves back together again, had a slightly better chance than those who might have had a slightly more rocky childhood who had other demons that they were trying to expel, who didn't have the resources to take a period of um, rebuilding and, and, and reconnecting with others in their lives and had to just go straight back into being a breadwinner and provider. And that was very difficult for people who'd had a very unsettling war. It's just such a, I mean, that's such a horrific story and unfortunately all too common with um, with a lot of these men who came back after having been prisoners under the most horrific circumstances. I think the chapter that speaks the most about this in the book is the one that describes the situation with marriages of the of the returned prisoners. And this all came about because of a, a misunderstanding with something written on the form, didn't it? Tell us about that. There was one question on the form that asked are you experiencing any material prejudice as a result of your captivity? Meaning, are you experiencing any ongoing financial disadvantage? And when I first opened the papers and I was looking at the forms, most people in response to that question had written a question mark or do not understand the question. I mean, I certainly something. don't blame them. That's a that's a that's, a, <laughs> that's a, a very complicated legalese statement. I I didn't know what it meant when I read it in the book as well until you explained it. Rather weird wording, isn't it? And despite the fact that so many people are writing question mark or don't understand the question, the trustees don't change the application form for twenty five years. They just leave it there. But then I started seeing some other responses that I didn't at first understand. So. Are you, experiencing material, are you experiencing material prejudice? Response, yes, my wife left me as a result of my experiences as a prisoner. Yes, I was divorced at the end of the war. Yes, my wife committed adultery. Yes, unable to have intercourse with a woman. And I thought, what is going on here? And then the penny dropped and I realised that these people thought that the question was asking them about marital prejudice. So they felt they were being invited to talk about their marriages or to talk about their sexual life. Isn't that just, it's just extraordinary that this, this misunderstanding of a complicated legal word and a you know, complicated sentence reveals this whole new trove of information that never would have been revealed at all. It would have been gone. We would never know the you know the the, the 
the situation with a lot of these men, with all of these men, had this not exactly. been revealed. So what sort of interesting things came out once you realised that they'd mistaken the word material for marital? What did, you, what did that reveal about them? So it revealed that quite a few of them struggled with questions of impotence and they would put it down to the fact that they had been prisoners of war. And in a way, it's the emasculation of captivity made manifest in bodily form. They're saying my experiences as a prisoner meant that I could no longer have sexual relations with my wife or I would leave my wife frustrated on many occasions. And I couldn't believe what I was reading because men of that generation were very reluctant to discuss these matters um, in public, let's say. Uh, You also get people talking about how their marriages had suffered as a consequence of captivity. So then that unleashes a whole lot of writing about their experience of neurosis, their experience of depression, uh, their the way that they'd made their wives suffer. And some of them, I mean, you, you get two responses. One is to talk about how dreadful their marriages have been. But on the other hand, you'll get people talking about how marvellous their wives were that their wives had been their greatest support and they couldn't have done it without them. So you get a whole lot of evidence about marriage and and psychiatric difficulty in the response to those questions. And the other thing that also comes out, unfortunately, is some people who have been admitted to psychiatric institutions because they're very mentally unwell also then reveal their troubled marriages and the fact that they've been violent towards their wives. And you do read about domestic violence and I then cross-checked some of those papers with the divorce records that are available and I just took a case study of New South Wales and you can see that um, the, the domestic violence that exists within those homes can be sometimes quite extreme because divorce papers often detail the kinds of assaults that have happened on the woman prior to the divorce. And that that's a really, the threads of why that happened are very difficult to disentangle. You know, um, were these men violent before the war? Did being a prisoner exacerbate their capacity for violence? Did, um, did being brutalised themselves turn them into perpetrators? You know, they're complicated questions. They, they certainly are. I mean, the whole period after any big war like this is a difficult one. We saw it after the First World War. We definitely saw it after the Second World War, exacerbated by the fact that these men had been through such horrific experiences. And and something that I think is really wonderful that you do in the book is this is this concept. It's 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 quite a concept, but I I, I like it. This idea that these men lost their masculinity. They were emasculated figuratively when they were imprisoned because they were supposed to be, as you said, they were supposed to be these brave, strong Anzac warriors and all of that was taken away from them and now they were they were humble prisoners. So they figuratively lost their manhood. And then those documents that you talk about reveal that in reality they actually had a, a, a literal loss of manhood that they felt they couldn't perform in the bedroom with their wife when they came home. It's an extraordinary link between this figurative concept of being emasculated by becoming a prisoner of war uh, but then it actually playing out in reality as well. Totally, and some of the stories you read about it. um, There was a quote that I I cite in the book where a group were interviewed as they were getting off the ship and one of them says to a journalist, I feel like it's robbed me of my manhood having been a prisoner. And as you say, then to see that kind of metaphorical loss of manhood through defeat and through surrender and through captivity, translated into how they feel they can perform sexually. You know, one of the, there was a concern in the camps that the malnutrition and and disease and so on would affect fertility and would affect virility. And there was a common joke that circulated that said, the second thing when I get home, that I'm going to do when I get home is take my pack off i.e. the first thing I'm going to do is have sex with somebody. (laughs) Uh, But some men did find themselves 
incapable of performing. Now, was that down to captivity? We'll never really know because by this time, of course, they're middle-aged men. Some of them have got problems with heart disease. Some of them have got other physical issues that, that could in and of themselves lead to impotence. You know what I mean? Like it's not necessarily the case that captivity caused it. Maybe in some senses that the sen the the feeling of emasculation did lead to it, but it's one of those, you know, we can never really know questions. I think it is, but the, the fascinating thing is that you saw so many documents that reflect the same thing, that even if it wasn't uh, necessarily a, a direct correlation between imprisonment and, and then problems later in life in the bedroom, um, the men thought that it was. That's what I think is just so fascinating about this, that they thought, you know, they, they, they felt that their time in prison had robbed them of this ability to be to be sexual, to be good husbands. It's fascinating. And I think the other fascinating thing about that is that there's great sadness for these men that that part of their life is not working, but they're even sadder for their wives. This is the age of companionate marriage when both partners are meant to be fulfilled, sexually fulfilled in a marriage. And these men are just devastated not just for themselves, but for the fact that this is incredibly frustrating for their wives. And I found that very moving to read about men who felt guilty that they couldn't provide this to their wives. It's a really interesting revelation because this is decades before the sexual revolution. You would look back on this time and think it was a time when women were just obliged to do their womanly duties and, and not get anything out of this. Um, it's, 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 it's a real insight into the, you know, into the way marriages work and the tenderness that these men felt towards their wives and what they felt they'd lost by not being able to perform in the bedroom. Exactly, exactly. Just so many um, terrible stories about it. That's, and, and that's what comes out of the book. I remember reading in one section about I think I think you uh, the pseudonym you gave the man was Roy and the, the the painful letter he wrote to his uh, his wife Nellie and the very brief rejection he got back from her uh, saying that she wasn't going to come back to him I mean it's just so many painful stories that your book reveals when I read that letter in the archives I have to admit I cried I felt so sorry for him <laughs> he writes this letter saying I just miss your home cooked meals you I miss dancing to our favourite tune, remember when we brought our first baby home, how carefully we nursed her, how can you give that all up? And I just, I had a tear in my eye, I had to say, and the, and the response from her was just, you know, talk to the hand, I will never come back to you. And my heart broke for that man. It's a, it's just a catalogue of suffering, isn't it? It's a, it's a, it's a time. I don't, I don't think we can fathom it today. I think some of us can. I think some of us who are, who were the children of these men when they came back, uh, have a, have an insight into, into what life was like for them after the war. But it's, it's really the reason the book is, is so wonderful because of these, these things that it reveals. But it wasn't just about men, was it? Because there was a, admittedly, a small number, but there were female prisoners that were taken by the Japanese as well, weren't there? Oh yes, there were, and. I've written about them in other contexts. I didn't write about them so much in this book because I relied very heavily on the, the trust fund papers and the women, interestingly, didn't really apply to that and didn't really reveal much in their responses to it. The men were much more um, verbose in that regard. But the women had been, so there was a group of them who were captured when their ship was sunk as it was leaving Singapore. The ship was called the Viner Brook and they ended up, on internment camps in Sumatra and there was another group of them who were captured in New Guinea and taken to Japan. So there's two groups of women POWs and it's really interesting. When the prisoners of war are first released, there's a huge amount of attention paid to the release of the women prisoners, partly because a whole group of them had actually been massacred on the beach at Bangkok Island um, in what is now Indonesia and there'd been one survivor, a woman called Vivian Bullwinkle, who just has the most memorable name ever. Like how can you ever forget the name <laughs> Vivian Bullwinkle? Very true, very true. And she was quite the, the celebrity when she came back having survived that massacre but she was also 
release with other women who, who hadn't been part of the massacre in Sumatra. And there was a lot of media attention trained on the women. And I think it's partly because people were so shocked at what had happened to the men and it contradicted so much about what people had believed about Australian soldiers that the focus kind of turned to women a bit as a way of thinking and talking about the imprisonment experience without having to face those much more confronting questions about masculinity and war that imprisonment had had opened up, I guess. And the women, but but there was also, you know, a bit of, anxiety around the women too because when and there's a lovely story that illustrates this when the women were found in Sumatra they were in pretty bad condition I mean like like many people in camps throughout that part of Southeast Asia food had been in very short supply they were very emaciated and they were taken into the hospital in Singapore and there were uh, men in the hospital who'd also been prisoners of war who virtually had to be restrained in their beds and they were shouting out, let us up, let us at these bastards, that they were so horrified at the way, inverted commas, their women had been treated. Because, of course, in the way we understand war, women are meant to be protected. They shouldn't have to bear its worst horrors. And Australian men, I think, were very ashamed that, their women had been exposed to this really horrible experience. Do you think race played a big part in that as well? I mean, throughout the war, we know there were very strong racial connotations, particularly in the fight against the Japanese. Do you think this concept that that the you know the the the, the Asian the the dirty Japanese had you know imprisoned our pure women was that an element that came out in all of this as well? Oh, absolutely, and both for the women and the men, actually. So for the women, there was a lot of concern that perhaps they'd been made to perform sexual work for the Japanese. So it's really interesting. The nurses, the minute they're released, they do a press conference in Singapore. Imagine anybody being allowed to do that today. (laughs) They were interviewed the minute they got off the plane and they, as one, said, we are telling you here and now that did not happen to us. So they immediately shut down any talk that that could possibly have been their experience and they spoke as one on it basically until the day all of them passed away. Do you think that was the case? I mean, it seems unlikely that, I mean, as horrific as it is to discuss, it seems unlikely that a a group of women could be imprisoned for that length of time and not be exploited in that way. Well, there was a particular incident that they talk about where uh, a group of them were taken to a, quote, Japanese officers club and expected to perform. But the way they tell the story is that they were able to successfully repel these advances by making themselves look ugly, by selecting a particular group of women to go who would be more experienced at beating them off and that, you know, their their defiance had meant that the Japanese then left them alone. So we have to take their word for it at that point. It's a, it's a difficult situation. But tell us more about this this racial uh, aspect of prisoners. I guess the the thing to keep in mind was that there was an added layer of difficulty for people taken prisoner by Japan because... You need to keep in mind that this is 1940s Australia. It's still the era of the white Australia policy. There's a belief, a widely held belief, that European white races are more civilised than those other races. So to be taken prisoner by an Asian captor had a layer of racial humiliation that, many people found difficult to deal with. And the popular phrase that POWs were treated like white coolies kind of encapsulates that sense that the racial order had been inverted or turned on its head. Just explain that, explain what that means to us, this phrase white coolies. You say that quite a lot, but what, what does that actually mean? Sure. So coolies were, in this time, usually 
Indian or Chinese labourers who'd migrated to Australia or the United States or Fiji or some other kind of colonial situation where they worked largely for white overseers. So to be a coolie was to be an Asian labourer, usually under the charge of a white person. So to become a white coolie meant that racial hierarchy had been flipped on its head and that white people were being made to work and were being treated like Asians. So it's a little quirk of speech that's meant to encapsulate this flipping of the hierarchy that white people had been made to work for Asian overseers. So I think it it sort of sounds funny, but it actually encapsulates the inversion of the racial order that people felt had happened here. And interestingly, when the prisoners were released, then you get a whole series of stories in the newspapers with photographs showing Japanese people working, quote, like coolies under the charge of uh, British and Australian forces overseeing their work. And the message of those photographs, of course, is order is restored. It's just a, it's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, it is a different time that we're talking about here. The, the, this was the, the Second World War was a you know it was a totally different era, but it's not that long ago. And 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 I think these are the elements that that work that, that your book has brought to light that, that your research has brought to light. It's just it was it was just such a different time. Our attitudes have changed, and the but the attitudes at that time were very very important. They were very important to the people who lived through these experiences. They were important. Uh, to how they remembered these experiences after the war. Do you, do you find that comes through, that, that these attitudes of race and, 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 and issues with the Japanese persisted after the war years? I think as a lot has changed. The, the stereotype, I guess, is the embittered POW who'll never buy a Japanese car and won't buy a Japanese TV and, and never is able to let go of the hatred that they felt because of that experience. And, of course, there were people like that. And many people probably met former prisoners who held that attitude. But one of the things I was trying to do in the book was show that there was another group of prisoners, former prisoners, who took quite a different attitude, who wanted to say that, we need to move on from the pain of the past, that we need to reconcile with the Japanese, that you can't blame a whole race of people for the behaviour of some of them, that the militarist group that controlled Japanese society was no longer in control. And the, the move for reconciliation with Japan actually had some former POWs right front and centre. So a good example would be Wilfred Kent Hughes, who was a federal government minister in the Menzies government. He led the debate in the Australian Parliament for the ratification of the peace treaty with Japan and said, we have to show Christian forgiveness to these people and we can't hang on to hatred. You had also people like Albert Coates, who was a doctor on the Thai Burma Railway, who went to Japan for the war crimes trials actually and he went and visited Hiroshima. And when I looked at his personal papers, carefully preserved in them was a little yellow envelope full of photographs of the damage done to Hiroshima after the drop dropping of the atomic bomb. And he basically wrote that the Japanese people had suffered enough and that we need to let the wound heal. So there's a lot of not a lot of POWs, there's a significant group of publicly prominent prisoners of war who argue very strongly that it's time to move on and that the path to world peace is not paved with people hanging on to the resentments of the past. It's, um, it's incredible to think that after all they'd been through, they still had the capacity for this sort of forgiveness. But, it, um, I mean, it speaks volumes about them as people, doesn't it, that, that, that even after everything they'd been through, they wanted to move on. It's, just a, it's, it's why your book is so remarkable, and it's been really wonderful. Thank you so much. As I said, the book's called The Battle Within. Uh, it's available now, and Christina, thanks for being on the show.
My pleasure. Thanks, Matt. 